This is breaking news from Channel 7 Eyewitness News. The news more grim, the images of the devastation more horrifying tonight coming from Hawaii's Maui Island where the death toll is rising. And good evening at 11 o'clock, I'm Shade Betterinwa. Tonight officials confirmed 53 lives lost in the wildfire that tore through Maui's historic town of Lahaina. Relief supplies are being rushed in and stranded tourists are rushing to get out, but the airport is jammed. Eyewitness News reporter Jim Dolan monitoring all the new developments tonight. Jim? Sade, the voracious fires on Maui have raised whole towns. Shops and businesses that thrived in the vibrant tourist areas reduced now to cinder and ash. Waterfront hotels filled with tourists empty now. The guests lucky if they make it to the airport that can't get enough flights in to take them out. And in all that chaos and all that loss, the death toll in Hawaii keeps rising. The wind was a tidal wave of gasoline on Maui's waterfront fire, fanning, fueling the flames that swept through historic Front Street and the homes beyond. It turned the ground in Maui into a searing, blistering cauldron. Even escaping was perilous. I couldn't even make it across the street because the pavement was so hot. And now I have second-degree burns on the bottom of my feet. The fire is on Front Street and it is time to go! It was a huge black smoke back then. And I did, I, it's indescribable. And the flames left behind ashes, frames where buildings stood, massive devastation, in paradise. It's over. It's gone. It's completely gone. It's a war zone. The historic buildings that were there, the church, the prison, the uh, uh, mission house, all these different things are gone forever. They can't be replaced. They can't be rebuilt. At the airport, tourists slept on luggage carts and floors wherever they could find a few feet of open space until a seat was open on a flight to take them anywhere. Some didn't even make it to the airport. The kids, uh, we're just trying to keep them calm. You know what I mean? They're pretty scared, um, obviously. Nobody's really comfortable. You know what I mean? You came here just to like sleep at a resort and you end up sleeping in the back of a Jeep. It's not ideal. Helicopters joined the effort to battle the fires and today, President Biden promised federal assistance to help. Our prayers with the people of Hawaii, but not just our prayers. Every asset we have will be available to them. And we've seen, they've seen their homes, their business destroyed, and some have lost loved ones. And it's not over yet. In Lahaina, on Maui's west coast, a majestic ancient banyan tree grows. A single tree, its many sturdy trunks rise to the blue Hawaiian skies. Its roots sink deep into the fertile volcanic soil in a town square beside an historic courthouse. It has stood there, just 60 feet tall, but enough quiet, cool shade for the whole town square for 150 years. But the fires this week have burned its branches and charred its ancient bark. Officials are not sure yet if the tree will survive. So much there has not. Sade? Mm. Just devastating. Jim, thank you. Well, turning now to the weather, the storms here tonight have all but moved out. And that is good news as we look towards tomorrow and the weekend. Meteorologist Danny Beckstrom in tonight for Lee Goldberg, timing it all out. Danny? Sade, it's all good news as we turn toward our Friday. Temperatures are going to be in a good place. Our humidity already beginning to drop thanks to that shift in wind direction. And tomorrow, sunshine. We're still tracking some low clouds out there, but really nice to see that the radar has calmed down and you see the cloud cover moving out quickly as well. I want to zoom in here to the eastern end of Long Island. It was the last area to clear. Uh, we saw a thunderstorm wind gusts near Sw Smith Point close to Brookhaven of 45 miles per hour and the rainfall totals out east for the Hamptons over through Montauk are really impressive. These are rainfall totals as of 9 p.m. I haven't seen an update within the last hour. Montauk will be over an inch easily. In fact, some radar estimated rainfall totals of tonight upwards of two inches. West Hampton about an inch and a quarter uh, of rain fell tonight. So just really, really wet conditions. And you see right Town, almost an inch and a half, an inch of rain for Trenton today. So it was busy. The radar was really busy, but we're quieting that down and even the cloud cover is beginning to clear, which means by the time we wake up to start our Friday morning, sunshine right from the get go. Temperatures are comfortable. Humidity is comfortable. High of 86 and uh, we, we stay nice into the weekend. I'll have that full weekend forecast for you coming up. Shade? Okay, Danny, thank you. Well, tomorrow, family and friends will pay their final respects to NYPD officer Alexis Martinez, who was shot and killed by his own father 
father, who relatives say suffered from mental health issues. Eyewitness News reporter Josh Heiniger spoke with the police commissioner tonight at that officer's wake. They spend entire careers dealing with other people's misfortune. Tonight, scores of city cops supported one another through a searing loss of their own. It was his smile. The moment he walked in, I was like, oh, here he is, the guy with the nice smile. At only 26, friends say Officer Alexis Martinez was a rising star in the NYPD. After just five years, he'd already passed the sergeant's test and was working toward a detective shield in Bronx Narcotics, where he and Sergeant Lizette Henriquez became fast friends. We went through COVID, we had riots, and yet he was still in it. You know, he was all about his community, and I think that he had great mentors, and that's what he wanted to give back. He always wanted to set an example and help the kids. Always the best for the community. As a rookie, he was assigned to the 3-4 precinct just a few blocks away from the funeral home, where his fellow cops have built a memorial to their friend. Beautiful person, a person that was always happy, and it's uh, just an example of, you know, who to follow. But while he risked his life for New Yorkers, he would lose his life at home, shot by his own father, who then turned the gun on himself. A family tragedy that's still simply impossible to explain. He was an excellent boy, and we can't even make sense of what happened. It is definitely a tragic, tragic Tonight, Police Commissioner Edward Caban paid his respects at the officer's wake. Just two weeks ago, Caban took a picture with a group of cops, including Martinez, a young officer just beginning his career with so much promise. He's just a kid from the neighborhood, you know, young officer, joined the NYPD baseball team, played baseball, beloved by all his fellow officers, gave back so much, worked so hard, and now you know, our thoughts and prayers with his family. It's clear from the turnout tonight how much of a fixture Officer Martinez became, not just in the NYPD, but also in his own community. His funeral, set for tomorrow morning. In Inwood, Josh Einiger, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. The body of New Jersey Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver will be transported to the Essex County Courthouse tomorrow. There, she will lie in state just as she did today at the Capitol Rotunda in Trenton. Oliver died last week while serving as acting governor while Phil Murphy was on vacation overseas. She was the first black woman elected to state office in New Jersey and before that, the first to serve as assembly speaker. All too often when people get in politics, they forget where they come from uh, and who they really are. But she never did, and I, and I found that to be one of her better qualities. On Saturday, there will be a memorial service for Oliver in Newark. Her family has not disclosed her cause of death. Meanwhile, a 17-year-old will face a judge tomorrow in the killing of professional dancer O'Shea Sibley. Sibley was fatally stabbed nearly two weeks during a dispute in Brooklyn. The teen accused of doing it now facing second-degree murder as a hate crime. Eyewitness News reporter Safan Kim with details on how long he could be behind bars if he's convicted. There are many laws being passed in many states that seem to target the LGBTQ community and I think is responsible for increasing uh, rhetoric of hate towards this community. So today uh, we're announcing and we just came back from following the indictment that the 17 year old man has been charged in this case and indicted with a count of murder in the second degree as a hate crime. The teenage suspect in the fatal attack facing 20 to 25 years behind bars if convicted. Investigators say on July 29th, he stabbed O'Shea Sibley at a gas station in Midwood after the gay professional dancer intervened between a group yelling homophobic and anti-black slurs at another group. After initially de-escalating the situation, words were exchanged once again, and that's when investigators say the teen pulled a knife and stabbed Sibley. The teen suspect turned himself into cops late last week. The Brooklyn DA stressing the importance importance of prosecuting the case as a hate crime. We're going to stand up for Mr. Sibley, for the rights of he has to dance, to be exuberant, uh, the right that he had not to stop dancing because it offended someone else. DA Gonzalez also weighing in today for the first time on surveillance video that captured the confrontation. Witnesses tell investigators the suspect claimed he was Muslim and was offended by the way the group was dancing as he hurled anti-gay slurs. Mr. Sibley and his friends weren't armed. We know there's no question that they weren't armed. They have uh, no shirt on. And so uh, we know that 
defending yourself from being an anti-gay or an anti-black comment and arguing back is not a cause for someone to take a weapon and do what was done in this case. The suspect is not being identified because he's a minor. He'll be arraigned here in court tomorrow morning. In downtown Brooklyn, Stefan Kim, Channel 7. Eyewitness News. The search continues tonight for a prisoner that made a brazen escape from a Manhattan hospital. The NYPD says Yen Chun Chen tied towels and sheets together, went out the window, and rappelled down from the fifth floor at Mount Sinai Beth Israel Hospital in Gramercy. He then used a ladder to make it to the ground and hailed a cab. Chen was arrested last month for criminal possession of a controlled substance. And calls tonight to do more to fix problems at Rikers Island and prevent a federal takeover of the troubled jail. A federal judge approved the first step of the process to place Rikers under federal control. The judge citing violent and unacceptable conditions inside the facility. Seven people have died there this year. The commissioner of the corrections department told the court, despite the problems, things are better. Unanswered questions tonight about how a 30-foot boat went airborne and crashed into a home on Long Island. Newscopter 7 was over the scene today on West Fire Island. And you can see the boat is overturned. Two people were on board. One was killed. The other was knocked unconscious for hours. When he came to, he found a cell phone and called 911. But reaching the scene was tricky. We were not able to get our boat or any of the other fire boats as well as the police or the Coast Guard near the scene because it was extremely shallow, treacherous waters. There was also two dogs on the boat. Both of them survived. Now to a frightening accident today involving an MTA bus and a truck on the Upper West Side. This is Citizen App video of the scene at Amsterdam Avenue and West 82nd Street. The collision happened just afternoon. Authorities say the bus driver and 11 other people are being checked out at hospitals. None of them have life-threatening injuries. A special hearing today on asylum seekers with members of city council asking about the 60-day shelter limit imposed by the Adams administration. Who determined that this was the way to go? Was this a collective? We do not want anyone sleeping on our streets. And if the council walks away with anything today, I hope it's that understanding. Mayor Adams was not at the hearing. Instead, he was hosting a top aide to President Biden, again asking for more federal help. We are learning details tonight about just how quickly the Justice Department wants to get the trial started for former President Trump. Special Counsel Jack Smith requested a January 2nd start date for Trump's election fraud case. In a filing today, Smith said that date would give Trump's legal team time to review evidence and prepare a defense. Trump's lawyers have one week to respond to the request and propose their own date. And new in Exit 11, a look at how access to something as simple as water might cut down on childhood obesity. Also ahead, a big award for a firefighter from Long Island. Details on what he did to hear the title Firefighter of the Year. New hope tonight of settling the Hollywood writer's strike with talks now set to resume tomorrow. The Writers Guild has told members it expects representatives from the studios to respond to their proposals. The writers are seeking higher salaries, better residuals, and protections against artificial intelligence. They've been on strike for more than 100 days. In tonight's health alert, a new study shows access to drinking water can reduce childhood obesity. In the study, kids in schools that installed water dispensers and preached the importance of drinking water were seven times less likely to be overweight. The study doesn't explain why that is. One expert says children who don't drink enough water consume two times more calories from sugary beverages. A Long Island firefighter is receiving a big honor tonight. Justin Berry has been named Firefighter of the Year for the state of New York. Berry has been a member of the Riverhead Volunteer Fire Department for the past seven years. He earned the honor by rescuing a 77-year-old man from a house fire that was quickly spreading. Definitely is a great honor to be, to get the medal. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing for the department, you know, shows that our work does pay off. Most firefighters are waiting to do this their whole career. Most of us don't get the chance to do that. And then he's a younger guy and he, got, he might have another shot to do it again because he gives 110% every day.
And congratulations to you, Barry. And Barry is a Riverhead native and also works for the town sewer district. He was quick to give credit for the rescue to all Riverhead first responders. Well, this is a very big day for us here at Channel 7 as we celebrate a special anniversary. Tonight, the Empire State Building was shining eyewitness news blue. That's because WABC TV is celebrating 75 years today. The lights of the iconic Empire State Building were lit up in honor of that milestone tonight. And the celebration started this morning where members of the station, myself included, and New York City Mayor Adams talked about the important role this station has played in the tri-state. So I know you're doing your job, but you're allowing us to really uh, see what's great about the, the city over and over again. And they have been there for it all, providing breaking news, critical reporting. We don't just report on issues. We roll up our sleeves and do everything we can to support, celebrate, and entertain New Yorkers. Absolutely. And in honor of this anniversary, Mayor Adams issued a proclamation declaring today WABC TV Day. And I have to take a second to acknowledge all the incredible people behind the scenes that make this station what it is. It is definitely a team here, Danny, and now you are certainly a part of it and a uh, part of the rich history. It's been so fun all day long, Sunday, to, to get to relive some of the just absolute legends that have walked these halls and still walk these halls. And I have to say, she looks beautiful in Eyewitness News Blue, I right? Think so. <laughs> Forge is shot there, and it's nice that we can actually see the Empire State Building. The cloud cover moving on, the radar wrapping up. Still feeling a little sticky out there, but we're fixing that problem as well with wind shifting out of the west-northwest already. Backed up the radar a few hours so you could see the last of the rain move through. We are now clear across the board, not just in rain, but in cloud cover as well. And high pressure building back in for your Friday, so that means sunny skies ahead as we close out the work week. Moving overnight into tomorrow morning, our lows falling to the 60s, some spots even in the 50s, so comfortably cool to begin our Friday. Friday with sunny skies right from the start. Tomorrow afternoon, a few clouds in the mix, but much drier conditions. We're talking no rain chance, and the humidity will be noticeably more comfortable. That means highs in the mid-80s, close to where we should be this time of year, are going to feel really pleasant. So I hope you get the chance to get outside and enjoy the sunshine tomorrow. By Saturday, a little uptick in humidity. That means it'll feel stickier first thing in the morning, but in the afternoon, enough moisture to support a few scattered storms. I wouldn't say it's indoor time on Saturday. Both Saturday and Sunday, there is an isolated storm chance, but it's it's fairly sporadic, so hit or miss, and I think there are still plenty of dry hours to get outside. So a nice weekend ahead of us in general, but tomorrow going to be the best bet of the weekend, just given low humidity. The breeze is already out there. It's noticeable, but that wind speed is going to pick up tomorrow as the wind direction stays out of the west-northwest. That's key to keeping humidity low. But I wanted to show you these numbers just so you know that it is going to be a bit on the breezy side. Not even quite to the nuisance level, but you will notice that light breeze in the afternoon. You just have to remember that that's what's keeping it so comfortable with the drop humidity. So looking hour by hour, we're already clearing out that cloud cover. Sunshine tomorrow morning. This forecast just looks spectacular and I think it'll feel really pleasant as well. Our lows in the upper 60s for most of the area, but our northernmost suburbs could even start the day in the 50s tomorrow, but mostly sunny from the start tomorrow morning and less humid. Tomorrow will start sunny, maybe partly cloudy at times in the afternoon as that breezy wind continues. Highs near the seasonal average in the mid 80s. With that west wind, 10 to 15 miles per hour waves are about 1 to 3 feet. Moderate rip current risk across the area and tomorrow night. No weather worries for Friday night plans. Clear and comfortable with 60s in the suburbs. The wind direction will begin to shift Friday night into Saturday, so that's going to bring the return of a little more humidity for Saturday, fueling a few spotty thunderstorms in the afternoon and evening, and same story uh, for Sunday as well. So I wanted to give you an early look at the weekend getaway forecast. If you're heading to the Catskills, that's where we'll see a slightly higher storm chance, not a washout, but a few more scattered storms. But for, for the Jersey Shore and for the Hamptons, another fantastic weekend ahead of us with highs in the 80s. And if you're staying in the city, not bad either just a few spot thunderstorms, and then we get that next more widespread chance for rain on Tuesday. Shade? Okay, Danny, thank you. For Twitter history up for auction, new and next at 11, a look at some of the things up for grabs now that Twitter has a new name and logo. By the atmosphere. A pretty cool Virgin Galactic launched Taurus to the edge of space for the first time today. The rocket ventured more than 50 miles above Earth's surface, spending a few minutes in weightlessness before returning to Earth. Customers were on board, including John Goodwin, an 80-year-old former Olympian with Parkinson's disease. The other two were a mother and daughter from the Caribbean who won a contest. And you can make the trip to space yourself as long as you have, I don't know what, a half a million dollars lying around? Hmm. Well, Elon 
Musk is doing some cleaning up now that Twitter is X. It's auctioning off remnants of its old brand. Specialty items for sale include a reconstructed barn and a large birdcage wielded with a Twitter logo. Two paintings depict Ellen DeGeneres' 2014 Oscar selfie, you remember that, and yeah. former President Barack Obama celebrating his re-election. Bidding is set for next month in San Francisco. And before we talk about what's coming up in sports, we want to hear from two people who have sat right in your chair, Sam. <laughs> two former sports anchors who have a special message tonight as WABC celebrates its 75th anniversary. Hello, Tri-State. I am Rob Powers. I'm a news anchor in my hometown of Cleveland now, but before that, I was fortunate enough to be a sports anchor at WABC-TV. What makes Channel 7 special are the people, those of you who watch and all of those I worked with. I may not be at WABC right now, but I can tell you, nobody was more proud to walk through those doors every day. 75 years, you're looking good, WABC. Congratulations and cheers. To many more. I'm Scott Clark, Channel 7 Eyewitness News, sports director, retired. 75 years. Boy, I'm an old man, but WABC TV was delivering broadcasting excellence at least five years before I was even a sparkle in my daddy's eye. Happy 75th anniversary, WABC TV. You are out of this yes. world. <laughs> yeah. Them. And what Rob said, it's about the people. It yeah. is. It really it is. is. And they're both such great guys. And you guys are fantastic. Oh, Happy we, 75 You're a years part of this uh, rich history as well. So, this is amazing. So what's up for sports tonight? we got what a lot going on. we got the Little Leaguers and a big deal for our local Little Leaguers. Coming up in sports, Massapequa looks to move into the semifinals of the Little League Softball World Series. Can the team from Long Island overcome a late deficit? Highlights after the break. Well, New York baseball fans had championship hopes this year, and they may get them, just not the way they expected. Instead, it's the kids from Massapequa that are both in the Little League World Series. Tomorrow night, it's the boys' baseball team playing for the right to go to Williamsport, but the girls' softball team already in the World Series, and they took the field today against Puerto Rico in Greenville. They are leading most of the game until the fifth. That's when Eden Tesario started the rally, this ribby single to tight, and then some heads-up base running. The ball getting away from Puerto Rico's catcher and in comes Cassie Van Schuyler with a go-ahead run all part of a four-run fifth inning for Massapequa they win it five to two and they advance yes indeed to the World Series semifinals on Saturday it's crazy it's I don't know how else to describe it it's just I didn't think this would be happening but it is and I love my teammates they help me out with everything they're like no matter what you do you're gonna do something good you just gotta do your job and I did what I needed to do and they did something great. Joint practices are complete. Now come the games. The Giants kick off their preseason slate tomorrow night against the Lions in Detroit. The Jets, they take on the Panthers Saturday night in Carolina. But if you can't wait until then, we've got some preseason action for you right now. Patriots and Texans at Foxborough. Check out the catch by Houston's Tank Dell. Yeah, we're going to take a look at this again because check out the reaction by the New England sideline. They can't believe it. Neither can we. Take another look. The rookie spins, bobbles, recovers, and somehow makes the catch for the touchdown. Yes, indeed, what a catch. Well, the Mets and Yankees both had the night off. The Bombers head to Miami tomorrow. They face the Marlins, where more than just their playoff hopes are on the line. Yankees are 59 and 56 right now. If they end the season below 500, keep this in mind, it would be the first time they finish with a losing record since 1992. Mets host the Braves tomorrow night, where Pete Alonso will look to pad his record, breaking state. The polar bear hit his 35th homer of the season last night against the Cubs. And with that, he becomes the first Met ever to hit 35 or more home runs in four seasons. The only season he didn't reach that mark was the pandemic-shortened season in 2020. Alonzo already a Mets legend. And speaking of which, look who it is. David Wright was set to host the annual NYPD versus FDNY charity game at City Field tonight. Mother Nature, Danny knows about this, had different plans. Mm -hmm. The game has been rescheduled to next week, but the captain and still taking time to present the Right Thing Awards to Detective James Tobin of the NYPD and firefighter Joseph Greco, Jr.
baseball players or athletes get put on a pedestal. And, you know, for us to be able to root thank the, the true heroes of the communities, the men and women that risk their lives on a daily basis, um, meant a lot to me, and I wouldn't miss it for the world. And it was so great to see David Wright out there yeah. Oh, yeah. presenting those awards. Hey, I just want to give another shout out to the Massa Pico team, yes. um, the girls yeah, team. Yeah, they played so the semifinals they on, won Saturday. on Saturday. They won on Saturday. Okay. Go Massa Pico. That's right. Yeah. Go girls. <laughs> Knock them out. Got it. We'll be right back. And that's the news for now. I'm Shade Better and One. I just want to take a moment as we celebrate the 75th anniversary here at Eyewitness News to say thank you. We so appreciate each and every one of you who support this station. Good night. From Hollywood, it's Jimmy Kimmel Live!